It's 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 a it's a buzz. When the crowd is really good, it's a real buzz. It's it's a wonderful thing when four musicians all lock in together and become one little unit. It's it's a fantastic thing. It's, it's like a weight off your shoulders. You can have the worst day in the world and a good gig or any gig, but just you just forget about the rest of the world while you're up on stage. There have been times where we've played to a full house of people and everyone is going mental. And then you're like, oh God, there's only 10 minutes left. You know, and it really changes the dynamic. When people get into it, we get that energy off them, we're able to reciprocate that energy. There's been things put to it, like contemporary folk and neo-folk and neo-trad. And I just don't know what that means. So to me, it's like, I think it's just, it's four lads, who, it's four lads who play music who are all into different kinds of music. You know, we're all from different backgrounds, we all have different musical tastes, and it just works. We all have our own little departments. James is the voice. It's not strings things about James, basically. And that's, a lot of people say that, not just us. I try and keep the gig together. I focus on that a lot. Strings and Things wouldn't be Strings and Things without Sean Longy and what he brings to the table in the band. The fact that I'm able to play along to what he's able to play along to, and we kind of lock in sometimes as well, it really does. We're able to complement each other, that's what I'm looking for. Once Simon plays the bass, it wasn't until he played that I kind of figured out what a bass is supposed to do. He's been a great asset to him, given the old Galwegian blood into the, it's the fray, with all us Tipperary men. <laughs> uh, he records all our music, he mixes all our music and he puts up with all our bothersome ways. Well, I wouldn't call them bothersome. No. We have our moments. Yeah. <laughs> Moncelli is probably the best cojon player I've ever met. I've never seen a man give it socks on a cojon like one, and what he can add to it. Especially his back and vocals as well. Owen's a fairly driven sort of person. He likes to have something done. He wants to get it done, and that is good. That's a good trait to have in any sort of group in any sort of line of work or anything like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it with someone else. There's been a lot of people to pass through this to make it what it is. Like, it's not just the four of us. I didn't think that they would want to, but when the idea to do this gig came up, it was, kind of, it was all Shelley's idea, I think, in a joking sort of way. It would be cool to get everyone back together. <laughs> like, yeah, right. I wanted to replicate the set list that the lads did the first gig and James was like no <laughs> I was like look we'll build something we'll come together There's been breakups in band in the band, and there's been there's been relationships in the band, and and there's been fights, and there's been this that and the other, and disagreements, and people leaving, and this that, and but I think everyone generally in the mix is more mature, obviously, than they would have been eight, nine, ten years ago. I forgot that last um, that last line I wrote. It's so cringy. <laughs> hey, it's safe to look back on these things and know that you've matured. Yes, I do better. <laughs> I thought about it and we said we could. And I asked Luke and Izzy and Stevie and they said, yeah, we'd love to. We all still would play it together in some way, shape or form at a session or at other gigs and stuff like that. So why couldn't we just all do a gig together? There's no weirdness, there's nothing. It's just like, we're just, we're gonna play a gig for the crack, all of us, and see what happens.
we went to the local Kyoto's in Lockmore Village from the age of like five. Oh, that was probably seven. Oh, oh yeah, no, seven, yeah, three. five, six, seven. I moved into Lockmore, and in Lockmore it was you played GAA or you played an instrument. Luke uh, played the banjo first, and roughly around the time I moved to the banjo, he moved to the mandolin. And we were always kind of to and fro between the two of them, so it was always nice to have someone else there as well who lived in the village, who was as into it as I was, so we got to kind of bounce off each other, and Izzy was there too, so it was, it was a great little atmosphere to have. That's when we started playing in pubs and stuff, trying to um, get more comfortable playing... With other people and like... And in public. And in public, yeah. I met James at a disco, at a teenage <laughs> disco. <laughs> And you could actually tell the three of us were not supposed to be there. <laughs> Meeting Sean, Luke and Izzy, specifically the three of them, uh, you know, they were they were similar age to me, but they were traddies, trad heads, whatever. You know, they, they played trad. For sure, James is like into like his metal music and stuff and like his metal yeah. music. <laughs> 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 Fucking mammy. <laughs> I heard bands like Metallica and, and Megadeth and Pantera and it was it was basically hard rock metal bands, Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and it was just that that just became the general obsession. I just I started to learn guitar. I started just to teach myself and pretended I knew how to play. James started coming to the trad sessions with us and he would have been from a more heavier background, but then he kind of opened up into our world of trad. It's like weird to see how different he was back then when he didn't know any, like he wasn't familiar with like the trad music and all yeah. that and playing along with that. I saw what they were doing, like playing in sessions with each other and I'd never really seen that before. People my age just kind of sitting around in a circle playing because they could and I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> and that kind of, that's, that started the change in the tastes of music. Luke and Izzy, I, I always remember, like, they had such an in-tune ear with just everything. It, like, their ears were so good for picking up this and that, and especially with this now, they're, they're really helping along with some of the harmonies. And, even down to just fine tune, even just about how many notes certain people are singing here or there. I'm mad for like doing harmonies and stuff and kind of instructing people what to do <laughs> when it comes to vocals and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's bossy, but you know, it gets the job done, I guess. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all as in tune vocally or musically at all if I had never met them. So it was James. Jacob, Jacob Kyo, hi Jacob, and uh, myself and Luke, wasn't it? Yeah. Just the four of us. So Jacob at the time played the cajon or cajun, box, whatever. <laughs> As the piece fell, how the band started was like, I was asked to do a session and my auntie asked me, my auntie Lucy asked me to do the session and from there, the four of us, we went into to Glass Sheens and Holy Cross and we played and we were asked if we would do a gig. We just got a gig out of it. And we were like, oh my God, our first gig. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Felt like super <laughs> <laughs> We called it Strings and Things because we had no other name to call it. It was just, the, it, was the, it was a simple name that was picked to put on a poster, quite literally, because we couldn't go as the Nesbits and two, two metalheads. <laughs> I don't know, there was no other options. It was just like, well, we call it Strings and Things. Yeah. <laughs> We were second to last on the bill, which was the first time that happened, obviously, and the last time for <laughs> for years. Uh, but I was nervous. I think we all were. It was all it was all of our first gigs. It was kind of like first time on a stage because it was like kind of, it was prompted up. It was like a. It was like a first time being mic'd up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. The trad session definitely helped the early sort of style, I suppose, of the band, and. Um, it, it went well. Williams and Zing.
singer killed Hattie Carroll With a cane that he twirled round his diamond ring finger At a bottom hotel society gathering There's a great song, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll Which um, would have been something we would have done Every now and then, back, back then uh, When we started playing again for the first time, like first practice or something, I think it was very natural. Mm. Yeah, you know I, mean? I think it, I think it was a, it was kind of like riding a bike for the first time in years. A bit rusty, but it was after a couple of songs in, it was like we didn't stop playing. Hundred acres with rich wealthy parents to provide and protect him. Like we were playing together at the sessions, and any time we went to practice at the run, it was just kind of like, are we, you know, we play, we play a bit, but not much. We were all just messing a lot. We yeah. didn't get a lot done at practice. <laughs> <laughs> we actually got more done at sessions than we did at practice. Yeah. Disgrace, criticize my fears, but take and one of the songs that take me you dancing. I had like a like, so, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> Patty Carroll, she was a maid, she worked in the kitchen. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Fucking hell. But That's such a happy tune. Yeah. Why didn't we do that? Because we don't. We lost the lyrics, and I forgot the bass line. I wrote for it. <laughs> Typical. Stevie's recollection of how he joined the band is different to mine. Because when I was asked, I hate this. When I was asked, <laughs> when I was asked if I wanted to be in the band, I said I don't mind. And oh I, Jesus! So I never actually said yeah. My recollection is that we maybe played two to three songs, went in at pizza and watch shite on the telly and I think we did ask the question his I think his recollection is that nobody asked him and then James about two years later was like do you realise you've never officially actually said you're in the band so I had to actually say yeah but about two years after playing with them alright okay okay alright let's go hey dickhead if you're in a band now you can fucking like <laughs> piss out of me come on <laughs> What? <laughs> I have my eye on you. Just because I'm in a band? Just because you're in the band now, is it? No. <laughs> no. Maybe. That's why you've been fucking nine years. <laughs> I was doing the county sessions in here in the county bar in Thurlis and uh, I was just I wanted to be in a band. Got chatting to James. I actually went to practice with them then just to kind of try out and that there I met James, uh, Izzy and Luke that day for that trial. When Shelley would have come in at the end of 2013, Stevie just before and we we, we pretty much existed as a five piece for the better part of the next two and a half to three years. It was difficult to get gigs as a five, as a five piece, just kind of really just starting out in your first year of a band. You were putting five people underneath televisions and in corners by stoves and <laughs> that was that was the that was the reality of it. Um, there was one time where James wasn't around <laughs> and we, had, we were like, was we thought about it and we all yeah. had enough songs and tunes and stuff that we were like, we could do a gig without James. And it was the worst gig <laughs> I have ever played in my life. I went to sing some of my songs and I just could not find the key. About two songs in, Luke broke a string on the guitar. About another song later, broke another string. I think he finished the gig with two strings <laughs> yeah. left on the guitar. I, I think for a solid like 10 minutes after the gig, Owen just sat there on the box. Like, <laughs> and I just kind of stood there just like... Oh, I think I remember actually the day after that gig, I think I remember 
James asked us all how it went, and we were like, oh, it was class. Yeah, we it, was, it was one of the best gigs ever. <laughs> this was an absolute lie. <laughs> Nobody has fallen by the wayside. We've kind of kept with each other musically. Do you know what I mean? None of us have said, oh, well, you know, we used to play with him. He's got rubbish. It's not that case at all. It's basically, we are one band and we were just kind of alongside everybody else. And everybody else kind of came, kept up its bar. When you play for, uh, with anyone for so long, it's, it's like you don't even have to speak to each other. You just know what's, what we we're, we're going to play, when the hops are going to come in, just by a look or just by even a feeling of, the, of how the tune is going. Developing that with the lads over the years is really cool, even not just live at gigs, but at sessions as well, or even just at practice. The first real album, our nickname to that is the our nickname for that is the Black Album. It was our first taste into kind of doing like a recording studio, and it was fun back when we did it in 2014. Like we were young and naive. I can't believe we got away with calling that an album. It was like a load of covers. Cover album. And it, the sound. <laughs> like, I didn't know how to sing. I didn't, I just roared and screamed. I just, I opened my mouth and went for it. And whatever came out, came out. And if it was going to be loud and extremely violent sounding, then so be it. <laughs> when we listened back to it, we were like, Jesus, this is brilliant. We have, we have a CD. I'd say James has... I'd has say he has one of them, yeah. But oh, Dale definitely has a CD. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to play like a, a clip from that album, of, like one of the tracks or something? <laughs> oh, God. Gonna write me a letter. Gonna send it on the phone. Gonna send it to. I was meant to sing a song in that as well, and then record, we recorded it, and I listened back to my voice and said, no, <laughs> <laughs> scrap it. <laughs> Time passed, and the songs got, and James, we, we all improved, and then we listened back to it, and we were just like, we sold this to people. We, people owned this CD, and they paid money for it, and we were like, God. Remember the... The, mu the music videos that Owen put up. <laughs> Gonna write me the letter. Oh, with the, 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 oh, the car bitch trips. <laughs> the bit more Jesus. Was it? If you could find a clip of that. Like, <laughs> I think, I think they might all be on private. Oh, that's they're YouTube chronic. Movie. It's so bad. They're chronic. <laughs> 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 it was a, it was a, like, it's a chapter in, in our history, like, do you know what I mean? We, we did the album launch, our first album launch ever in the Anor, and God bless Mars Below in the Anor at the time, they were very gracious to us, being a young band, only, only out of diapers in the music scene. Um, they let us into the band, into the ballroom for nothing, and fed people get them drink and ever and we invited our families and promoted this album to people and people bought it. They are so uh, many T's in the album. You have tea, the letter T, you have turbulence, you have the hollow man, the safe way out, the mystery inch, and too much to ask to take the time. That's five. So and then the I think we were just at that stage where we're like lads were together a while now we should start kind of making more um, original stuff. Turbulence, that was a bigger project um, because we wanted to write original music and we had bits and pieces that we wanted to show each other and I went away and I wrote some lyrics and Isabel went away and wrote some and James did. Bending over 
rubber band was trying to make it right Crawling in the dark was trying to see the light Your sweat and tears are drying out But you see the end is near now War's the pin, you fuel the fires you're in Battle sky, the emotion, nothing to the skin Simple words to fix a bridge Civil life again Wars of Opinion was like the first song that, that I think I, I think that four of us wrote together myself myself Luke Izzy and Owen Owen wrote the words and between myself and the Nesbitts we came up with the melody a lot of people think it's about the weather it's it's not it's there's a, a deeper meaning into it look overhead there's a shine in the sky the rain. I love writing lyrics, do you know what I mean? I'd sit down and write five or six songs and lyrics in a day and throw them to James and we trash it out with kind of the John and Paul situation with the Beatles. Look overhead, there's a shine in the sky, the rain is gone. Rel like, Ward's opinion is about relationships, about relationship issues. It's kind of got to do with, like, arguing with people pointlessly over the most stupid things and realising it was kind of stupid and stuff. Life continues on We left the band. Uh, N75 was formed. It was like a offshoot of... It was like, it was like Owen and James and... Dan Matthews and Dan Butler. And me. Luke parted ways. Stevie had gone before that. I suppose it was different when, like, you know, having Sean there instead of Luke and Stevie. Sean's brilliant. Sean doesn't know how good he is. <laughs> when I joined the band, the album was basically nearing ready to go to be recorded. I knew a lot of the songs the lads would play because I played session with them. So I could look at this set and it's like, right, I know this one already, I know this one already. And it just became a matter of trying to fit in properly with Izzy, say. Rather than being like, right, I'm playing this by myself for myself. It's like, no, this is part of something bigger. He is, I suppose, the keeping the trad element in this band that has always existed in one way, shape or form. He's actually the person I've known the longest out of this. The way I tend to play banjo isn't exactly normal and I've just been able to keep going with that all through the years. Uh, the lads like how I play it, so it's just, I can just have fun. I just, I just have fun on stage and have fun off stage. He is truly fantastic and sometimes he, could, he might put himself down by saying he's not as good as this person or that person, but I'm just like, no, you're, you don't need to think of that. You're, you're in your own little, you're in your own little field and your own little cash grades. He, he's brilliant. We worked more collectively with Turbulence because we were kind of just, we had like myself coming in with lyrics, James and Izzy at the time coming in and Sean with tunes, do you know what I mean? So we kind of sat down and tried to iron it out. And it was a, it was a few weeks of kind of being a bit nervous and not knowing what to do, but we got there in the end. We recorded that in uh, Twin Oaks, which is Keen Cronin's place out the back of his house. Keen Cronin from Seskin Lane, obviously. <laughs> Big shout out to Seskin Lane. But we had, we had a lot of help from them, actually. I just want to mention them now is Seskin Lane, Owen, Owen Ryan, and uh, Shocks at the time, Nigel Shocks, he was in the band. And Keen, the three of them helped us out massively with that. And if you listen to Turbin, some of the tracks you hear piano on it, that's Owen Ryan. And all the bass was done by Shocks. Um, or at least 80% of it was done by shocks. These concrete holes, I walk them on. My feet are starting to swell. Another man got in my way, on my way to the well. Two songs that always stood out me off that album would be Wars of Opinion and The Safe Way Out for how drastically different they are, even to Hollow Man. Hollow Man is, is just... It's just the person inside you, or it's the darkness inside you, or it's the it's the, the anger inside you. It's me. It's it's just my own kind of spat at the world in a way. I, 
have to be in the farm to do it, but it is definitely a song I, I really love and definitely one of the songs of the first originals that start that caught on. I watch the city burn with a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> I'll watch, <the> burn. <laughs> I'll watch the city burn with a bottle of bourbon on a hill where it's easy to see. Fuck you. <laughs> that's just, that's my that's my uh, thing with that. It's just fun. It's fun to sing something like that. There was a full, between us releasing Turbulence and going to Florida, there was a full rotation of a band. So when we released Turbulence, that was the summer of 2017, and we just, we chipped away with it, with what we had. Isabel parted ways, and we went as a three-piece for a while, myself, James, and, and, and Sean. Izzy being gone made it difficult to kind of promote half of the album which was kind of frustrating but we had run out of people that we knew <laughs> and that was a bad thing so for a while we had like stevie helped us out and luke helped us out and um but we wanted to find someone permanent At the end of this 2017, we got Owen Salmon in the band. He was a massive lift, in personality-wise, because he's, he's gas, but like, in playable -wise, playability, musicianship, whatever you want to call it, it was a great lift to us. And if someone said, no, you're going to be in a band, a trad folk band in Thurles, <laughs> and you're going to go to Disney World and you're going to play a music performance. Uh, I wouldn't believe that. I would have said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Owen joined the band in around December of 17 and we flew to Florida in May of 18. So that's the bones of not even six months, barely the bones of six months. And Owen Salmon was on a plane with us to, to Florida. Yeah, so he was he was fresh meat. He fell we, into we a dream. Used, yeah, we used to joke he fell into a dream situation. January or February, we had met the lady who, who's now become our booking agent, Pauline. She invited us, she gave us a message on Facebook and asked if we were interested in coming up to her, her jetty jam. Uh, we, met, we met our booking agent up in Cavan, uh, first time meeting her. Uh, Owen was only in the band a couple of months, I was only just over a year, year and a half in the band. We went up, did our slot, played our originals. She told us then at the end of the night, I'm putting you forward for uh, a trip to Florida. Self and Owen Shelley looked at each other when, we said, when she said it and just rolled her eyes and go, here we go again, someone's going to offer us this or offer us that. And, and say they know someone in such and such a country and they can get us a gig there. Uh, I think Azerbaijan got mentioned a few times of all places. I'll get you to go here, I'll get you to Denmark, I'll bring you to Holland. And uh, Canada and America and England and fuck all is going to happen. <laughs> I remember specifically she said, it's like, I have a possible gig across the pond. And I remember thinking, oh, we're going to England. And it's like, no, no, America. The uh, booking, one of the booking promoters for Raglan wants to see you. And we were like, huh? And she was going, yeah, this is, this is happening. I told you it was happening. And I was thinking, okay. <laughs> a man called David Hayes is quite a busy fairly well respected person in the music world and worked with a lot of a lot of amazing cool talented people um, came to came here to town and met us and um, came into Hickey's and he had us set up our gear and just kind of perform of, I don't know a Sunday afternoon there was nobody inside in the pub and Ollie was okay with it and, and first song in Mr. Inch set Sean Brooks string we ploughed on and didn't stop just stay going 
do what we normally do with a gig and just play along until Sean at the same finish went back, banged straight back into where we were at the song and continued on from there. And David Hayes said after that that the fact that we did not stop when the string was broken proves you have it. And he just took a video of it and sent it back to whoever his people and he said that he'd come over and see us and properly for a gig so we, we set up a gig in Bowles and invited I suppose everybody out and he was kind of banking on that and uh, he, he was there and he, he said yeah we'll do it we'll do it with them and we we were booked to go over there for initially three months in the summer of 2018 which turned into four I mean it was so surreal for that to happen uh, like there, we were still, we were very, uh, we were in disbelief over the whole thing. We didn't think this thing was like, what, well, this is actually happening? Or we're going to America for four months to play music? Are you kidding me? It was cool because Owen, Owen Salmon wasn't in the band too long. So, and it was the first time that the three of us, myself, Sean, or, or Owen Shelley had done anything like that. So, so we were going into it together, into a new thing. Um, it wasn't just like, oh, we, we're bringing the new lad on. It's, it wasn't like that at all. It's like we had, we were all facing a, a fairly big challenge all together. About six months later, we're getting on a flight. Flights paid for, visas paid for, everything ready to go. It was odd. We became taxpayers. Yeah, we became taxpayers Fucking that day. Fucking mad shit that my first, My first ever job was technically for Disney. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. And off we went to Florida and loved every minute of it. We played six nights a week for four months straight. We got to really actually know each other and really actually play with each other properly. And it really helped you kind of realise, right, this is a a proper thing you can actually spend your life doing and if, if you get good enough at it and you meet the right people in the right places you can actually make a proper living out of it and share your music with everyone. Well Ragnar Road is it's an Americanized version of an Irish pub essentially you wouldn't find an Irish pub that large in Ireland big huge place a big stage and you're looked after and all you do is you come in and you plug in and you're on in-ears and in-ear mo wireless monitors and stuff like that. so you can walk around the pub and you can play it and that's kind of what they encouraged us to do was to really interact with the crowd there We were playing every day. We were refining our sound. We were becoming tighter as a band. We were becoming better musicians in our own regards. It just all went by so quick, but it was such a, f it was probably the, the most fun time I ever had playing music was, was that four months. From sound checking at four o'clock in the morning and to Literally, the last gig where we were up on stage with some very talented musicians and dancers. There's actually videos of it up on YouTube of that final night. And just the general emotion of the whole night was just something to, that I'll never, I, I'll never forget. That was something else. I, there was such a buzz in the room that night. And there was a kind of a little tradition over there <clears throat> that if it was someone's last night, Everyone else, all the other musicians, who would usually be gone home by the time we played because they'd been there slaving away all day. Um, if it was someone's last night, they'd stay out and they stay, everyone stayed out that night. And a lot of the people that we'd met that time came back and all came, it was just, just a wonderful night. By the end of it, there was about 30 of us on the stage singing, was, I don't know what we did, it was 500 miles or something. <laughs> well, it was brilliant. If I could relive one night, one gig, I'd, I'd relive that one. That was that was superb. The Irish are happy with what's in front of them, whereas the Americans, when we announced that we're going back for Paddy's Day, 
They want to know the dates. They want to know when we're going to be there, even though we're only going to be there for four days. There are people booking holidays, booking flights, booking times coming from every corner of that massive country abroad. They're flying in to our two hour gig. In Ireland, it's like, oh yeah, we came from Waterford. We drive, we drove like an hour to sea. It's like, oh wow. But then you hear in America, it's like, oh yeah, we decided to push our flight a day ahead so that we would see you guys gigging again. You're like, really? No way. Or we came back, we were here once, you know, and we came back and we're here for a few nights. And you're like, what? We've seen people go haywire and that's pretty cool. We saw people break dance one night in Raglan. A couple of lads came in and they, like, chairs and tables were cleared and they started and they began break dancing to, like, some set of jigs. It was the most wrong thing ever, but it was wonderful. <laughs> By the point that we were in Florida the second time in 2019 um, to the following year, that was when we decided and that we made arrangements that we would uh, live in the same house and that we would uh, record the second album. Like I said, I think it would just be handier because we had planned to do the album and I thought if we're going to do the album, we're better off probably all being in the one apartment. Boom and Pedantic were kind of wrote in Florida and there was points where James and Sean would literally sit away for hours in Sean's room and bang out this tune and myself and Jay Owen were just getting tastes of it. This is what we're at now and we're like listening to it. Oh yeah, I can do something to this. So we got the apartment to ourselves, and it was it was good. Uh, it was a good experience, and we made it a home as well yeah. for those nine months. We like properly, and uh, that had its ups and downs. <laughs> we they, we had moments where we did, you know there'd be little spats, spats and whatever. But like I mean, we lived with each other. We were going to get over. We had a gig the next night. You know, man, the fuck up. <laughs> second time there was a longer stint. We had, we, we didn't have to play as much, um, but tougher. There was a, it was, it was tougher. It was a lot tougher. And especially the four of us being in each other's faces all the time. We really, you know, we really got the sense of uh, what it was like to really be a, a, a band. Yeah. So that was our daily routine. Leave a half eight in the evening, get home at two. Probably stay up until five or six because that's what happens. And then stay in bed till three or four. So mm -hmm. it just became a kind of just repeating of that. And if you had someone else living there with you who was getting up earlier, we wouldn't have had the same space or time or comfort to actually make the album what it was and actually put that much time and thought into it. So uh, I would like if we went through some of our original songs, if that were okay, for the for the for the benefit of yourselves and the, and the ghost of CD. So we had a lovely whiteboard that we filled up with. Oh, uh, I had all the songs going along, and had all the instruments, or vice versa. And you tick off everything that was done and things that needed to be added. We had somewhat of it. We had all the songs recorded and whatever. We hadn't it all like properly touched up yet. And Pauline came over to listen, like she came over for Christmas and she wanted to listen to it. And obviously, you know, being part of the team in a shape or form, she was entitled, <laughs> you know. So we listened to it, turned it on to Alexa or whatever way on, put it out for us that day. And we were just listening to it. And we were like, this is, this is, this is awful. What are we doing? Okay, let's go over again. <laughs> we listened back to it I said, boys, this is a lot of crap. 
Like, like they, and I remember Owen Shelley standing up and just doing this, going, what the hell is wrong? So literally, Pauline left and we just, the four of us looked at each other and said, bin it. So I said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to wipe everything. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a click and I'm going to record James rough. So he just plugged into and he played the song just and recorded a rough vocal that gave Owen Shelley an idea of where he was in the song. Owen Shelley came in, recorded him perfectly, and then it went James, um, and then it went Sean and me. Even though I should have recorded second, I just left it till the end so I could hear all their bits and then try and come up with something that was a bit more concrete. Purple Souls lyrically, I think, is a better question for Owen. Usually what would happen is he would write lyrics and I'd just sit and I'd read them and and I read that and I started to just down pick. <laughs> and it became a kind of it became quite it became a heavy song. Been up and down this dusty road. I need a place to rest my thoughts. Will someone come show me the way, but still I travel day by day. It has a really sort of heavy feel, a metal feel, just from down picking it and then doing a kind of a harmony thing near the end with the guitar and the banjo. I love, I love shit like that. I want to do more stuff like that, you know. So musically, that's one of my my favorites. We recorded the album in Owen's bedroom in Florida. I wouldn't record in a room like that again because I felt that uh, the sound was very kind of like this. Everything was just like close. Everything was, it, it, it was, but it worked, you know? And I think the sound of that album is what it was and it works for that sound. It's, it's an album that isn't really the same. It's basically 10 to 12, it's 12 tracks of basically different. So on the first album we had a song called Safe Way Out, which I suppose is about kind of about my, what something my mother said to me, not necessarily about her, but in my own little cute way, dedicated. And um, I wanted to do another song in the same vein, and um, I don't know. One night I was just it, a song just fell out of me, and it was My Dreams Are Not Enough. It's all quiet now on this hillside. Which is just essentially, I, I lost my dad when I was 11. And it is, it is just about how, how I feel. <laughs> but mu musically, I wanted to do more with that. And I had a, arranged a part that would happen with a high fiddle. And I just, I, I remember writing the song to myself and humming this thing and I thought that I just I'd love to hear that on a fiddle. Over now, but I don't want to wake up. It's all over now. Before I even touched it, I had James listen to it, because he wrote it, and I said, Man, I haven't touched this song yet, and this song already sounds excellent. And I'm gonna leave it at that. It's only gonna be the two boys playing banjo, guitar, that's it. And a fiddle will come in somewhere halfway through. And that is it. It's a hard thing for any, <laughs> for any child. But, um, you know, you can't, uh, you can't deny how you feel about stuff like that and writing lyrics and writing songs is, is um, good therapy. And stuff like that is, is good fodder for songs. I think one thing we've come to learn as a band and as musicians is, say, from the trad background, it's uh, everyone plays at the same time, everyone plays a tune, everyone plays the same thing. And that's kind of what I had coming into it. And, and for a lot of years, it's like I heard that said to us, it's like, lads, maybe you should not all play at the same time. And I started to realise over the years then, it's like where you can drop out to make it sound better, not where you can play to make it sound better. And it's, it's, it was ever kind of trying to learn, it's like, what works, what doesn't work. It's like, do you want to show Dynamics. off? Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, arranging, all these mad things. 
Music is a conversation and you don't need everyone talking at once sometimes. By the time COVID happened and we were shipped out of Florida with two hours notice, the album was 95% finished. So when we came home and had some time, we did finish. We did finish it up, and and uh, it, it was it was basically done by the summer of 2020. So Sean's mum, Ethel, who um, um, writes really lovely poems, she she gave us, or she she at least said it to Sean, who said it to us about if she were to give us one of her poems, would we put a song to it? And I thought, yeah, that'd be lovely. And what she sent was Jig Time. was sent to me, it was sent to Owen Shelley, and we quickly came to the con conclusion, oh God, this is about Sean. She wrote poems for all her life, she has hun hundreds of poems, and she wrote this and she brought it to me, and I remember sitting down with James like, we need to make this into a song. It's about loving and about caring, and I think we put a lot of love and care into the song because of that. I, I felt a, a personal attachment to the song for the fact that she wrote it. And essentially, if you're just to take that person's side out, it is a mother saying that they'll be there for their child whenever. And that's just the most beautiful thing you could ever read. My friend Aaron, Aaron Devery, he'd said it to me a couple of times about doing a music video and I said, but well, we've got this and he came up with a whole story. As he said, and he was right, and this should be something that's dark, because it is kind of, it is kind of dark. And it is kind of sad. Jig Time was shot, the music video was shot during lockdowns. And it was taxing to do this. And in fairness to Cal and to Aaron, who shot the music video for us, people, young lads just walking down, they're like, oh, you're shooting a music video, are you? And can I be in it? And we are just like, you can just see the will to live losing in the two boys as we're fighting the rain, so between the rain and that, it just took a very long time to shoot certain parts of the, song, of the video. They were trying to get Paddy Harding to to shout at Ethel, but Paddy is, is is such a sweetheart. Like he just he just he couldn't he just couldn't. So he said it he said it in his own way. But they really tried to make it like bam, and he he just he didn't. <laughs> But love him for it. <laughs> I love what what came out. I really do. And I I I actually still consciously, and we played the song a hundred times. But I I still consciously um, try not to think about it because it does genuinely make me quite upset. <laughs> We actually got the album recorded in the bones of, I'd say, a month and a half. All the bits and pieces, even the frills and trills of the likes of Fionn and Quiva coming in to record their own bits and pieces. And a little ear from uh, David Farah, a few other people came to what it is today and something we're very, we're very proud of, you know. 
And what you'll notice as well is if you listen to that album, everything was super fast and that's because we were over in Florida playing five, six nights a week and I was like, boys, these songs are very, very fast. And they were like, but that's how we do it live. And I was like, okay, fair enough. And uh, when you listen to the album now, it's just really, really, f everything is like super fast compared to the way we play it now. But uh, I think, to be honest, that's all part of uh, who we were then in that moment. So we were able to kind of look back at it and go, well, everything is super fast because we were tight as hell playing five, six nights a week, you know. Is it? Smallest yeah. boy in the car. Come on, let's see. Yes, I am. No. Since we got the van and stuff like that, the world is our oyster, do you know, like the country, go anywhere. You're forgetting that if you're going half of the country, that actually could be a 12 hour day. And you have three hours up, you have an hour or two to set up, you have a two to two and a half hour of a gig, you have half an hour to an hour to pack down and leave and then three hours home. And it just all of a sudden becomes a very big ordeal for the sake you want to play two and a half hours music. I love, the, I love, I know I give out, sometimes I do give out about the driving, but like, I get to see the country and I love that role that I get to, to drive around and see the things and stuff and see this country that we have. Oh, and Shelley has some very late nights driving home. Uh, we've gotten home at five, six o'clock in the morning before for gigs and we've left at three or four o'clock in the day. It's just another day in the life. Five simple steps that we have to follow. Get over the slide. Even when we're having bad days and stuff like that, it just takes a kind of a, a quick look at each other or a turn or someone to approach another person. Like I could be, I could be in bad humor going on stage, and you're in your head, and you're kind of you're just getting through the gig or whatever. But there'll be a moment where like Sean could come over to you and just like stand there looking at you, smiling, and you can't do nothing but only look at look at his big smiley head, and just he just lifts you, and you just plow on, and then it just lifts you for the rest of the gig. Then it's just when you bounce off each other, it's always a it's a great feeling that you're not you're not on stage on your own. Oh, this is Strings and Things reporting live from London. Look, a goose! Look, it's a goose! It's like every time you get to go somewhere new, it's just like, well, well this is where it's brought me. It's brought me to this place. It's brought me to this place. It's just, it's just a nice feeling. It's like, what would I be doing other than this? The European tour of the trip to France and the UK and back home. That happened with Pauline. Um, she made connections with Mark Rosner of uh, the Rise Up Tour and Big Records. One of the best weeks of my life. Unbelievable. It was more like a little holiday, I thought, when we were in France. It wasn't until we got to England that it felt like work. So we played five gigs over seven days. That was fun. We were just, we were, we met a couple of different people and all very good musicians themselves and we had a laugh. Drinking cans outside Buckingham Palace at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. Playing or, rebel tunes in the whistle outside Buckingham Palace at two o'clock yeah, in the morning. Yeah, there was that too, yeah. <laughs> Being on the bus and like seeing someone pull out a guitar and you're like, oh, I want to play too. And like you get your banjo and you might never play with that person before, but they know a song that you know and you sit down and you just play the song with them and it worked. And you're like, whoa, cool, let's do another one. Yeah, it was a good experience. Like, it gave us the taste of like touring, basically just plane hopping, train hopping, bus hopping, car hopping. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Getting up early, uh, barely sleeping, and barely eating. We ate petrol station food, and we wasted all our money, and it was <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. It was very fun. It summed up. It's just like on the go the whole time. We live together, we work together, we're in a band together. Our heads must be somewhat together at this stage. Eat, sleep, pray. Yep. Like, taking a break, as in like what we've done for the start of this year, we just took off the month of January. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing how much you actually start to miss it when you're not doing it. But then while you're doing it, you're like, she said, love a break. So no, um, you'd miss it like you do. And the fact that we're doing the practices 
and the rehearsals for this show, it just, it keeps you fueled that we're really looking forward to this show and we're looking forward to get back on the road and just doing what we do. Yeah, it was kind of my, I won't say my brainchild, but I threw it at James as an idea to do a 10 year thing. It'd be great to do because all the band members have, they've all put their own little little nugget into our history board and we're grateful for that. I thought it'd be kind of fun to see how I gelled back into the band because they're completely different than what they were mm. when I was playing with them. Mm. And yeah, it just seemed like a really fun and exciting opportunity, like, and I was happy to be a part of it. And it's going to be the first time where the seven of us are playing, like, live at a gig, Together. which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is cool. And it's been a lot of work. We've really kind of, I think it's the best we can do, as per se. Yeah. And it has been fun rehearsing all that together and having the lads back in the band, essentially, for this, for this gig. The culmination of the 10 years of hard work is like bringing to this night is like this is what we've done, this is what we have to show for it and I, I think it's going to be really special. Testament to this is what we're doing is that we are so all still friends, which is which is great. I'm all willing to play something together and there's been no there's been no breakdown or arguments, which maybe ten years ago there would have been. <laughs> and that's quite nice. <laughs> um, we get along better now. Yeah, a lot better. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. I think honestly we've been able to get a lot more comfortable with each other. Uh, we're open, we're honest with each other, we're able to talk about everything. Uh, we all may fight sometimes, and we could even fall out sometimes, but that's what happens when you care about each other and you're stuck together. In a sense that the three lads, Owen, Sean and James, they're basically, I have a brother myself, but they're basically my little brothers. But James more so than the other two, because I have fought and battles and come to blows with James O'Mara Ryan so many times that like you can't help but love him and I do I love James two bits it's a friendship but it's like it's like a relationship with, with, with all of them do you know what I mean um, it's almost like family kind of well besides you know <laughs> We're all still good friends, and we always were. So won't you take the time and take in the journey? Won't you take the time and don't leave me so lonely? Don't leave me so lonely.